Central Australia, one of the most beautiful and unforgiving places on earth. People are still lured here year after year. They're trying to find a lost gold reef that a bloke called Harold Lassiter said he discovered around the turn of the century. Thirty odd years later, Lassiter found himself stuck in this cave here. At the time, he was slowly starving to death and was half blinded by Sandy Blight. But he sat down and he wrote a diary. It wasn't really a diary, it was a series of letters to his wife. This is a duplicate, a, a facsimile copy. And he buried it back there in the dirt of the, the cave floor. How it came to be found and this whole Lassiter saga turned out to be one of the great mysteries of Australian history. It all starts with Lassiter's claim that when he was just 17 years old, he found a huge reef of gold, seven miles long and 12 foot wide, way out west of Alice Springs. Anyhow, three years later, he reckoned he came back to this area with an old bushman surveyor called Hardy. And together they staked a claim on the gold reef. In those days, they used to calculate their position using a sextant in the sun. But Lassiter said they got their figures wrong. And shortly afterwards, Harding died. It took Lassiter another 30 years to get enough backers to try and find the reef again. They formed a company called the Central Australian Gold Exploration Company, CAGE for short. They're a motley group. Lassiter was the guide naturally, but the head honcho was an experienced bushman called Fred Blakely. Between them, they had several trucks, a plane and even a bicycle. The company headed off in July 1930 for Haas Bluff, out to the west of Alice Springs. See that lump of rock there? Pretty hard to miss when you look at it. That's Arts Bluff. This country round here is really significant from the expedition point of view because what happened here was that Blakely and Lassiter had a great big Donnybrook, great big brawl. Blakely wanted to go west. Lassiter said, no, no, that's not the way. My reef's southwest over that way. Anyway, Blakely was the boss of the whole schmozzle and they ended up going west. I'm not real sure why it was, but I suspect that he wanted to go that way because out there, there was an airfield. In the next couple of days, he was bringing in an aircraft and they're going to start searching from the air. It really got up Lassiter's nose. That night, he wrote in his journal, how on earth do they expect me to find this reef if they won't follow my directions? And when you think about it, he's got a real good point there. is tough enough even in a modern four-wheel drive. But with heavy old trucks and all the equipment, the 
traveling was terrible. One of the blokes wrote, our speed was so slow that even the flies could keep pace with us. And they attacked in their millions. Everyone was fed up and tempers were raw. They finally got here to Yai Yai Creek, where this airstrip was built. These old tins are the evidence that I've been looking for. I found another very significant campsite in the Lasseter story because this is the place they came back to time and time again. Their aim was to set up a base camp here at Il Pillar. It was here they kept all their main supplies and you can still see bits and pieces today. They waited here for their plane to arrive but that didn't happen. It had crashed near Alice and it took weeks to get repaired. Meanwhile, the others kept going about 150 kilometres due west to a spot called Mount Leesler. When they got to the top, Lassiter announced that they were too far to the north. Now Blakely was just starting to figure out that Lassiter had never been round this neck of the woods before in his life. It was with these suspicions that they all headed back to Il Pillar. The plane had arrived with another pilot. Lassiter took off on a recce and he was away for about two hours. During that time, he reckoned he saw the reef. Once he landed back down on the deck, the expedition pilot, the fellow by the name of Coot, tackled Lassiter. He said to him, hey, uh, I hear from the other pilot you found your reef. Lassiter said, yeah, but keep it to yourself. I swear you to secrecy. He told him something else. He said, you'll recognise it by this. And he drew three hills, he reckoned. They looked like women's sunbonnets. Whatever they're supposed to look like. And there was a fourth one. It was apparently about 30, 40 mile away. It was a big flat top turnout. A bit like a Quaker's hat, he said. Funny descriptions. Last of them must have had some sort of hang up about funny looking hats, I reckon. Can't understand it myself. At this point, Lassiter was convinced that the expedition should be really heading more to the southwest. Job. 
It's okay for me driving around here these days. I've got roads to drive on, but way back then, no roads at all. I had that big Thornycroft truck, six-wheel drive. Anyway, it turns out that they eventually did go southwest from Ilbilla, the way Lassiter wanted to go. In about 100 miles, they got something like 20 punctures. It was pretty rough country. You've got to remember what they're going through. They're going through mulga and bush and salt bush and everything. Bashing down the scrub as they went. In fact, the sand was so boggy, they even had to lay matting on the ground to stop the truck getting bogged. Well, eventually the boss bloke, Blakely, got so jacked off he spat the dummy and ordered everyone back to Alice Springs. But Lassiter was determined by now. So he teamed up with a young camelier called Paul Johns. The pair of them set off on foot with five camels, heading for Lake Amadeus and the Olgas. It took Johns and Lassiter 13 days to get here to Lake Amadeus. They just about had it when they tried to take a shortcut across the lake bed. A terrible mistake that nearly cost them two camels. There's something out here I really want to show you. You see these things here? They're camel pads, they're wild camels. They're not loaded down the way Lassiter's and John's were. And you can see even by the tracks that they're leaving behind that they're starting to break through the surface here. Of course, Johns and Lassiter tried to cross this lake in summer. And that's the time when the rains are around the place. And out there in the middle, it gets very boggy. And that's where they made their basic mistake. They failed to understand and appreciate their environment. By the time they got here to the Olgas, they were nearly dead. This is what Paul Johns wrote at the time. I dived my head into the water and nearly cried. And then he said this, Lassiter did not impress me as a man who knew this country but as one who'd read about it. Strange, eh? They pressed on to the Petterman Ranges, where Lassiter and Johns had a huge argument. As a result, Lassiter took off on his own for five days. But when he got back, he was carrying gold samples. He reckoned he'd found his reef yet again. Johns was suspicious, but together they went back to Ilpilla to get fresh supplies. Johns continued on to Alice to get more camels, leaving Lassiter to set out once more alone with the remaining two camels. Of course, if you're trying to move through this country, water's the number one survival priority. And if you've got camels with you, little water snake's no good. You need a proper big rock hole, like this thing here. And how do you find it? First thing you do is look around the countryside, look at the landscape, see the mountain ranges. In this case here, I'm sure that Lassiter, when he came through here, would have hugged the edge of the ranges, looking for little cracks and crevices. And then he would have been listening. 
those finches. Finches don't go very far from water at all. And the reason why is the fact that they're grain eaters. They eat grain all day. They get thirsty down the throat, duck back to the water. So they can't range out very far at all. And wherever you hear them, you know there's got to be a big mob of water somewhere nearby. Lasseter claimed to have found the reef by using this spot here near Lake Christopher as a reference point. But how do we know he actually got this far? Well, some years later, a bloke by the name of Michael Terry was passing through here. And he came across a tree marked by Lasseter. And what's more, he was told by the local Aboriginals that a lone white man once camped at this spot. Lasseter always maintained that the only way to recognise the Sunbonnet's landmark was to approach them from the west. We can take it from that that this is probably the most westerly camp that Lasseter made. He had to come to the edge of Lake Christopher, which is just over there, to get his bearings, to, to find out where his reef lay because it was from the west that he came and discovered it in the first place. And he did rediscover it. He found it a third time. That's what he tells us in his diary. Once he rediscovered it, he decided to head back to civilization. And that's when all these troubles began. It was at this stage that Lassiter's luck finally ran out, and in a big way. His camels bolted with most of his supplies. Stuck in remote central Australia, on this sand dune, alone, he was desperate. He decided to head back to a cave he knew and wait for rescue. Over the weeks he was here, Lasseter obviously had to feed and water himself. Fed himself a little bit on some of those figs that are hanging out on the outside of the cave there, but he also ate some rabbits that were kicking around the place. You look at this riverbed here and you think it was nice and dry, etc., but that's not exactly the case. See, not only does the bird life show you where you can find water, but also the animal life does. That's what we've got here. This hole here has actually been scratched out by a kangaroo because they can smell the water below the surface. We'll dig a bit out and see what we get. Ah, look at that. Beautiful. What that tells us is that the water table right here is only about that far below the surface. That's why the kangaroo can smell it. You wouldn't smell it if it was a couple of yards below, but foot like that, no problem. Tastes a bit sandy though. I find it really interesting that even in winter like it is now, you can have water like this just below the surface like that. It probably hasn't rained here for yonks. But Lasseter was now in such poor condition, he was almost beyond help. Nearly blind from sandy blight, he knew he was in serious trouble. After living in this cave for almost a month, Lasseter decided there's no way he was going to get rescued. The words are all contained in his diary here, which he buried in the cave floor just before he made that one last dash for civilization. This is some of what he wrote in his diary. The skeleton of me can scarcely support my clothes. I'm an awful sight. 
and the flies are maddening, and the ants are something that hell cannot improve on. I want relief and have saved one cartridge, but we'll stick it out as long as possible. Meanwhile, Cage, the gold company, had hired a local bushman called Bob Buck to look for Lassiter. That search took Buck over one and a half thousand miles in 11 weeks. Lassiter left the cave in one last attempt to get to civilization. That drive in there wasn't too bad at all, not half as bad as I thought it might have been. But this is the exact spot that I've been looking for, because this is where Lassiter died. Bob Buck found his body here, even though these days it's buried back in Alice Springs, this is where it all happened. But even then, there was controversy. Buck refused to sign a stat deck to declare that this was definitely Lassiter's body. But just have a think for a minute. He'd staggered here something like 30 miles in the middle of summer. January. Got quite a bit of help from the local Aboriginals, but finally gave up here. Forty odd years later, his son Bob, who was only five years old, remember, at the time when his father died, came in here and found the spot, again courtesy of Aboriginal help. He put this monument here. And I guess if you're going to look around the landscape just before you die, you couldn't do much better than this. The trouble with gold is they reckon that it gets into your blood. Gold fever, they call it. Take this spot at Altunga, for instance. It was once a booming gold town. Now, you may recall that Lassiter originally claimed that a surveyor called Harding had helped him stake the reef, but that Harding had died shortly afterwards. Well, Harding lived in this area for many years and he knew the gold fields around here pretty well, which has led one bloke to come up with an interesting theory. Right now, I'm to the east of Alice Springs, not the west where Lassiter was looking for his reef. There's a good reason for that. Over the years, there have been many, many people trying to find that reef and they've all got their own pet theories and ideas and all the rest of the carry-on. I remember years ago, the people in Alice Springs used to refer to them as uh, Lassiter's loonies. Anyway, there's one bloke I really want to have a look at. He's got his own pet theory, and his name's Bill De Carly. Bill's theory goes like this. Harding found the reef, not Lassiter. Lassiter heard about it from Harding, but never actually knew the area, or the fact that Harding plotted the directions back to front to keep the spot secret. With Harding dead, Lassiter obviously couldn't admit his problem, or he'd never have got the financial backing he needed for his search. So could this be the spot that everyone's been looking for? to the east of Alice Springs, not the west. I don't know, it all sounds like it's done with mirrors and take away the number you first thought of to me. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. The important thing is Lassiter himself and the legend that he left behind. 
may have left a gold reef out there too. I don't know, I can't answer that one either. I suppose if there is, someone will dig it up one day and we'll lock it. Anyway, that legend is exactly what this country of ours needs. You see, we're such a young nation, we don't have too many legends. And really, when you think about it, money can't buy them either. <laughs>